Why does Apocalypse Now begin in this hotel room? Why enter Willard's life at such a low point? It's because what's happening here, in the hotel, is what the film is ultimately about. Willard is having a complete mental breakdown, making this a story that's exploring what he's now capable of. What are human beings like in war after they've broken? Do they act differently to those who haven't? And what does breaking down reveal about human nature? These questions posed by Apocalypse Now is what I want to examine here. The idea of the breaking point is also introduced through dialogue early on when Willard receives the mission. Sometimes the dark side overcomes what Lincoln called the better angels of our nature. Every man has got a breaking point. You and I have. Walt Kurtz has reached his, and very obviously he has gone insane. In layman's terms, he's simply describing PTSD. Not long after, we find Willard rephrasing the concept even more bluntly. Mr. Clean was from some South Bronx shithole, and I think the light and the space of Vietnam really put the zap on his head. So it seems the film is not only interested in Willard's breakdown. In fact, the entire crew on the PBR reaches the so-called breaking point. For some of them, we can clearly pinpoint the events that transform them. Following Willard, Chef is the first one to break. It happens when they go collecting mangoes. After this encounter, Chef is clearly a changed man. I don't fucking need another one! I didn't get on the goddamn screen for this kind of shit! All I to do is fucking cook. I just want to learn to fucking cook, man. For Lance, however, the process seems more gradual and more drug-induced. During the Sampan massacre, his face is already painted in camouflage, suggesting he's changing. But I think it's safe to say that both Lance and Clean have lost it here. <laughs> Later, we see Lance moving in the same way Willard did in the hotel room when he broke down. The same goes for Colby, by the way, who was given the same mission as Willard and at some point told his wife to sell their kids. Chief, on the other hand, breaks down when the first crew member, Clean, is killed. Before Clean's death, Chief has got a calm and collected persona. You got some mamas in there? Some what? But now that Clean is dead, he's the opposite. A wild rage seems to have consumed him when they encounter the natives. Then there's Roxanne on the French plantation, who is also familiar with her condition, but uses her own more poetic term. It was the same in the eyes of the soldiers of our world. We call them the soldiers perdus, the lost soldiers. Kurtz, too, is clearly one of these so-called lost soldiers, something Willard seems aware of when the two finally meet. I'd never seen a man so broken up and ripped apart. But we'll come back to him later. While speaking to Coppola, writer John Melius reveals that an important inspiration for the script was Homer's The Odyssey. When you're growing up and you study literature, you're supposed to put all kinds of allegories in. That's what writers do. So I, I thought, well, this is sort of like the Cyclops. This is like, you know, Odysseus meeting the Cyclops. That's you know? wonderful for people to... And, the, you know, and then later when they meet the Playboy bunnies, those are the, you know, sirens. sirens, you know. But why would he use an old poem for his film about Vietnam? How does that story support this theme of the human breaking point? Let's have a quick look at both of Homer's epic poems to find out why. In the many battle scenes of the Iliad, the warriors frequently boast about their own ability in battle, comparing themselves to predators. Let no man forget how menacing we are. We are lions! While the enemy is compared to prey and being treated like it too. See the crows? Never tasted prince before. 
One important aspect of Homer's work is its depiction of how war turns the Greek victors into animals, because they themselves have treated their enemy like animals. The Odyssey could be said to explore how the Greeks attempt to transform back into humans. But before that can happen, it's their turn to suffer, very literally like prey animals. Early in the poem, they eat grass and flowers that make them forget their homeland. So Homer compares them to grazing cows, and the Cyclops that Milius used as inspiration for Kilgore eats the men of Odysseus as if they were sheep. So does the sea monster Scylla, while Circe, a sorceress, has the ability to turn them into actual animals with magic. But crucially, she can also make them human again, suggesting a way out of their suffering. With such a view of the Odyssey, knowing it inspired Milius, it's interesting to see how the line between human and animal gets blurred in Apocalypse Now. There are loads of examples of it. We've already seen Chef almost become the prey of a hungry tiger, kind of like Odysseus in the Cyclops cave. And in the mission briefing, we heard Kurtz compare the enemy to animals. We must incinerate them, pig after pig, cow after cow. Then there's Lance, who slowly seems to connect more and more with the dog than the other crew members. The coming encounter is peculiar too. Is that you, Lazaro? We've also got this fellow, who won't speak, but barks like a dog. What about you, fella? <laughs> and when they meet the Playboy bunnies again, who Milius thought of as the sirens from the Odyssey, creatures who were half birds, these parrots almost seem to become one with Chef and the bunny. And incidentally, minutes earlier, we saw these water buffaloes in the background, stolen and now marked by the US Army. Those familiar with the Odyssey might remember how Odysseus was often described as a cattle thief, a major reason for the gods punishing him. There's also the nickname of this soldier, Roach, and Roxanne's dead husband too, who had this strange confusion. He would rage and he would cry, my lost soldier. And he said to me, I don't know whether I'm an animal or a god. Out of all these animal references, the most prominent one is probably the killing of Kurtz, where editor Walter Murch compares the murder to the killing of a sacrificial animal. As a side note, this deleted scene was filmed too. In summary, I think it's safe to say that all of it points to Coppola thinking of this war, at its worst, as a kind of animal transformation. As we get deeper and deeper into the jungle, and these animal references become more frequent, we can also note how references to life back home in America gradually disappear. Early in the film, we saw lots of them. The most memorable one is obviously the surfing. There's the water skiing too, and late night barbecues at the beach. The more they tried to make it just like home, the more they made everybody miss it. The bunny show itself was another one. And listen to how they've named the command bunker at Do Long as well. Right up the road, there's a concrete fucking bunker called Beverly Hill. That's another reference to their home country. A bit later, a drugged up Lance even seems to confuse Vietnam with Disneyland. There could never be a place like Disneyland or could there, let me know. Jim, it's here, it really is here. With all this in mind, it makes sense to hear Milius describe the war as a California war. So it was this clash between California culture and this ancient place, you know, that had resisted even Genghis Khan, you know. And now it had had this thin film of communism, but underneath was this deep oriental mysticism that was coming up against California, against rock and roll. <laughs> Although this is tied to imperialism, I think you could argue that bringing California to Vietnam is a subconscious method to avoid breaking down, to maintain a grasp of the life they've been used to, to not let the jungle consume them and turn them into animals. But as we've seen already, the men break down regardless, and the use of war paint reinforces the idea that their old selves are disappearing. What's with all the green paint? 
Camouflage. How's that? So they can't see you. They're everywhere, Chief. Uh-huh. I want you to stay awake up there, man. You got a job to do. Willard, too, uses it before he kills Kurtz, while Kurtz himself only wore camouflage when he killed Chef. Does that mean the paint is a kind of shield? Like they're attempting to distance their true selves from the atrocities? Or maybe it tells us the darkness inside them is growing. Either way, I'd argue that the breakdowns we've looked at only makes them tap into a potential for evil that's already there, something all humans have in common. War is just revealing it, something Willard points to here. Have you a chance to know what the fuck you are in some factory in Ohio? It's as if the war peels back the layers of the self, layers of civility, of kindness and empathy, unleashing a dormant capacity for evil. I think that's what the title of the book that inspired the film refers to. A Heart of Darkness is not some entity out there in the jungle, or something found only inside so-called savages. It's nothing to be obtained. It's within all of us, and always has been, which could be why Coppola wants to make this a journey back in time. It's as though the, the river that they're on is a river into the past. It's going back into time, and they're becoming more and more uh, primitive, you know, replacing the hole in, in the, uh, the canopy of the boat with palms and, and material from the jungle. It's like they're becoming less this modern, sophisticated, mechanized army and more this uh, primitive uh, group of, of, of men going back into time. But why darkness, though? Why that word? If you've read Conrad's book, you may have noticed it was often concerned with the surface of things. So I think the title Heart of Darkness suggests that there's a nothing within us, below the surface, behind the face if you will. There is no core of morality inside us we can rely on once the layers of human civility are gone. We're like a shell, which is kind of what T.S. Eliot wrote. We are the hollow men. We are the stuffed men, leaning together, headpiece filled with straw. Kurt seems to have confused the embrace of this darkness inside us with freedom. He thinks the hacking off of inoculated children's arms is beautiful. And maybe this experience was his breaking point. I cried, I wept like some grandmother. Then I realized they were stronger than we because they could stand up. These were not monsters. These were men who were filled with love. But they had the strength. He now thinks that being able to follow orders, no matter how cruel, is somehow admirable. He also speaks of a longing for soldiers willing to use their capacity for evil to win the war. You have to have men who are moral and at the same time who are able to utilize their primordial instincts to kill without feeling, without passion. But do not be persuaded by his rhetoric. What he's saying does not add up to a functioning moral landscape. And let's not forget what Kurtz considered his ultimate nightmare either. I watched a snail crawl along the edge of a straight razor. That's my dream. It's my nightmare. It's a balancing act he's talking about. Perhaps he's suggesting he'd rather know for sure whether he is good or evil, and not both. Maybe it's also a foreshadowing of a death wish. Incidentally, the film often made a point of Kurtz being a moral, good man in the past. He was brilliant. He was outstanding in every way. And he was a good man too. A humanitarian man. This duality of good and evil is also expressed in the character of Kilgore. Here's Coppola speaking about him. I mean, he steps out of the plane and says, bomb the tree line back another 50 yards. And yet when a Vietnamese woman approaches him with a, with a wounded baby, Kilgore steps forward and takes the baby tenderly and gives it to a medic and says, I want this baby airlifted, despite the fact in a moment he'll uh, you know, bring down a rain of fire on people's heads. Again, the point here is that the human heart is never just good or evil, it's always both, but one can grow and overshadow the other. 
When trying to make sense of how evil has consumed the broken down Kurds, it's helpful to hear Coppola reveal what he saw central to his project. This is a journey into issues related to morality in modern time when we have the reach through our technology to amplify all of these uh, evil uh, instincts because ultimately we lie about what we're doing. That is the kind of Vaseline that enables these terrible things to happen because if you tell the truth, you couldn't possibly support some of the actions that go on. Perhaps as Kurtz finally lets Willard kill him, he's seen through these lies Coppola speaks of, those he's been telling himself and others. Or maybe he's simply landed on the same basic conclusion that Chef has. He's wacko, man. He's worse than crazy. He's evil. Either way, how are we to understand the ending? His famous last words. Is it an acceptance of the fact that he's a broken man with a broken moral compass? Is that what's scaring him here? Maybe so, but more importantly, I think the broken Kurtz in the moment of death has discovered he's not so different from the people he's described as savages, those he thought should be exterminated. We all have the same heart, and it is indeed frightening to have learned what we're capable of.